There we go. All right. Again, Psalm 72 and 145 and First Chronicles 28 and 29. Uh, and so as we do each week, let's start off with that historical background, and I'll restate again because I didn't have the recording going. This one's a little more ambiguous than what we looked at last week, especially where we have some pretty firm um, uh, historical connection between the Psalms we saw last week and uh, the account in, uh, in 2 Samuel. Um, what did you find in First Chronicles? What was going on in First Chronicles 28 and 29? Just briefly. You want to say something? No, I was just trying to see if I was on there. Are we muted? Or are we on? We're not muted. Okay. Well, David is, um, he makes known to all Israel, basically, that Solomon has been chosen by God to succeed him. And he also states about uh, all the provision and planning that's gone into place for the building of the temple to glorify the Lord. And that Solomon also would be the one to succeed in doing that. Um, he also encouraged them to give their allegiance to Solomon and carry on the work of the Lord. Very good. Else. Anything else? David, I, was I love. Oh, go sorry. No, go ahead, Kelsey. I I just loved. I was really struck with all, like his prayers for Solomon. Um, you know his his prayer that he would stay true and follow God's commandments and. Um, there was the passage that even sounded a lot like Joshua, to be strong and of good courage and do what God has called you to. And I, I, I think that was my favorite part of this week's reading. Was just, it struck me as a mother of a son that those are the types of things I should be praying for my child more diligently. Yeah, I think that's a good um, application to take from that, that, uh, that a lot of times we don't see is, is you do have this parent-child relationship, even though they're both adults at this point, uh, and this is, doesn't need to wait until they leave. Uh, this is this is something that certainly can be adapted to just what Kelsey said, and that's a prayer for sons or even as grandparents to be praying for not just sons, for sons and daughters. There are a lot of very, uh, you know, great elements of this, and it's all, you know, if you're especially in, the, in 29, where we have from 10 to 15 is really a psalm within uh, the book of Chronicles. Uh, and so it's one of those, if we go way back to the beginning of this study that we have other Psalms that aren't in the Psalms, that, that one is included in there, I believe. And if it's not, it should be. Uh, I didn't go back and check, but very good. Anyone else? In the plan of the temple, Solomon. The Solomon the temple, the ark in the... Speak up. I'm mumbling to Ed. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. go ahead, Donna. I was saying he had uh, told David, he or he had given Solomon the the uh, plans, uh, well, where the ark and the mercy seat were to be placed, and listed all the items that uh, and the weights mm -hmm. of all the articles that would be used in in the house of God, and uh, then rejoiced with the that the people so willingly uh, had given voluntarily much to the the uh house of the lord also and yeah that's the that's the one other element i was kind of waiting on somebody to bring up and that was just the the uh, excitement and the generosity of the people um that uh that really elicited praise from david i think you can get the real sense in here that it was he was really taken aback by how much the people got behind this uh, this uh, this project and Carol's pointing the verse to me in 29 9 it says then the people rejoiced because they had given willingly for a whole uh, with a whole heart for with a whole heart they had offered freely to the Lord David the king also rejoiced greatly and it's it's really uh, a, an old the Old Testament comparable passage to first Corinthians, chapter nine that talks about giving 
with uh, without not by compulsion, but freely and, and uh, joyfully. That's what I'm trying to spit out. Uh, God loves a cheerful giver, and uh, they they were happy to get behind this project. Any any other observations on the the First Chronicles passage? Again, we're going to talk about how they're directly or maybe directly connected to these passages later, but uh, anything else on the history? Why did, why did David need to really formalize Solomon as king before he even died? And, and that's kind of the picture you get here that uh, he, had, he had all but put him on the throne before he died. And depending on how you read it, it sounds like Saul may have gone ahead and taken up the kingly duties even while David was alive. Why was that necessary? Well, he had other sons that were vying for that as well. Yeah, this is a classical or uh, Old Testament kind of scenario where it wasn't necessarily the the one that was next in line or the the oldest, uh, but it was the one God had chosen and. David wanted to make it clear both because of the house of Saul, which we had talked about last week, uh, all that intrigue surrounding Absalom's uh, attempt to take the throne and then kind of the divisions and kind of the fissures already in, in uh, Israel that are going to really be there for the next 40 years while Solomon is king. Um, David wanted to make sure not just that, that his man was on, the throne, but that the nation knew that God's man was on the throne. This was the God anointed successor to the throne. And so you, this, this passage this week starts out with David meeting with the elders of the tribes. And uh, this wasn't just uh, a, a proclamation that David made. He gathered in the men that needed to go back to their territories and to their people and affirm this is this is God's king and we're going to get behind him. We see in first Kings that um, Adonijah had set himself up as king and uh, Nathan the prophet goes to Bathsheba and says you need to go to the king and carefully word uh, use your words and say you know I thought you promised that Solomon would be king so it was important for David to do this because Adonijah had already had a following and he would have been next in line right. for the throne so you can see why some would have followed him so it was important for David to proclaim this and not just to Solomon and Bathsheba and Nathan but to the nation of Israel yeah, if you want to get a fuller picture of, of more of the intrigue that was going on, I go back and read the, the sec, second Kings one. I think you go through six or seven and you'll get the whole picture of the building of the temple too. But those first opening two chapters are a lot of intrigue and even Solomon going to the point where he executed Joab. And uh, the reasoning behind that is all evident there. And I didn't include that here with the Psalm study this week, but uh, it really rounds this out that it wasn't just as simple as David saying, oh, Solomon's going to be king. There was still these attempts to try to circumvent not David's will, but God's will. And again, that's why it's so important that David had to affirm um, to the elders uh, that this was God's anointed king. Anyone else? Yeah, it tells us in verse 24 of uh, First Chronicles 29 that uh, all the officials all the mighty men and all the sons of king david pledged allegiance to king solomon yes so that was that was firmed up you know jim you said that he, he gathered them all together at the beginning and so it was a, an absolute confirmation that everybody was on the same page about solomon being king no question yeah, I, I think, uh, and we find that throughout Old Testament history, especially the, the importance of oaths and covenants amongst people groups, and uh, especially here in, within the, the nation of Israel. And we still talk, we still use that today, but um, it's not always as binding as it was back then, because if I shake hands with Marty and agree I'm going to do something, and I break my word, I don't have the threat of Marty coming after me to take my life if I, if I don't do it. 
but then, I mean, it wasn't just that. It was, uh, especially here amongst the people of Israel, it was an oath before God. And we see how those oaths, when they're not honored, uh, are, are very often, um, the, the consequences are brought by God. Not, not, they can be brought by men, but oftentimes they're brought by God. Very good. Anyone else? Okay. So our backdrop is the establishment of Solomon's throne and the idea of building the temple. And part of the importance of that as we get into these Psalms is that God has made that covenant with David, uh, but this is the, the next step in fulfilling that covenant. You might say the first step uh, beyond David himself. And uh, whether that covenant, whether God's going to honor that covenant. Now we know, of course, looking back, that God's absolutely going to honor that covenant. We know by David's character that David always views God as being one who honors his word. I, I think uh, for the people, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, let's see if God's going to honor the covenant. And so what we're going to look at in the Psalms today really has a lot to do with, uh, with that covenant in, uh, in its beginning stages, and then looking on, even on past us and how that covenant is going to be ultimately fulfilled. So let's get into the the Psalms themselves, and we're going to start out with Psalm 72 tonight. And let's talk about the let's talk about the Psalm itself for some of the details, and then we'll get into the heart of the Psalm. What's the classification or type of Psalm uh, that where did you find that that this kind of what kind of Psalm did you find this is? Messianic. Okay, it, is, it does have a very strong messianic. Uh, implications here good and enthronement and yeah, praise. Enthronement. go ahead what was the other one praise yeah good uh those are the three i had and you may have found again some other elements of other uh um classifications or types did anybody find anything else okay yeah i think basically it, it is an enthronement a messianic and praise psalm it's got all those elements very strong and we're going to be talking about those tonight it is written by solomon and we don't have any uh, special instructions here tonight so let's get right into the psalm itself what's the subject of this psalm and how do we know who this i'm sorry who is the subject of this psalm and how do we know who this psalm refers to I think the Lord is a subject. Okay. The yeah, Lord. I felt like it was odd for Solomon to be praying for himself. It seems like he's praying a prayer that for the Son of God. Okay. Good. Yeah. The the two that you normally get is Solomon or the Messiah, the coming Messiah. And you can see uh, both, uh, but one of the ways we know that this is uh, primarily referring to the Messiah is because of just what Anthony said. It would be odd for Solomon to pray in the way that he did uh, concerning himself. It seems to point forward. Uh, and maybe even more important, there are things in this psalm that can be true of Solomon but there are many things that only can be true of the Messiah. And so this is really a, a Davidic covenant psalm. It, it has in mind Solomon, but it has in mind every uh, king in the Davidic line to some extent or another, but it is fulfilled in Messiah, who we know as Jesus Christ. Uh, and so we'll, we'll look at some of those reasons why or some of those things that can only be true of the Christ as we go along here. Uh, and that what the next question is, what are some of the characteristics of this king described in Psalm 72? And as you as you give some of these, maybe identify what could be true of Solomon, but but the ones that can only be true of Christ. What, what kind of characteristics did you find? Righteousness. Okay, good. Peace. Good. Power. 
compassion, dominion, dominion, prosperity. And we're not talking about Joel Holstein. So. <laughs> Justice. No, Justice. Good. Oh. Good. Anyone else? Yeah, most of them. What's that? Anthony? When it says, may there be unlimited peace until the, until the uh, moon no longer shines, that's pretty much for forever. Uh, uh, so that to me points to an eternal king. Yeah, I, I think that's a that's a good phrase to focus on for a, for a minute because we can see that being applied to Solomon in in a uh, what do you call a I, can't, I just had the word and I lost it, but in the, you know, kind of an exaggeration, um, but it's actually literally gonna be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And so we have these great um, big statements that are often made about kingdoms or nations or leaders. Um, and and they uh, it irritates me. I can't think of the word I want. Um, hyperbole uh, that, you know, just these exaggerated claims uh, that we would wish would happen, but with the real subject of this psalm, they're going to happen. They're not just a wish, uh, and they're not just a possibility. Peace is going to reign until the moon is no more uh, in the kingdom of Christ, uh, and that certainly speaks about that eternal nature of his, his reign. Good. Anyone else? What about the kingdom? What are some characteristics of the kingdom? And some of them I understand kind of cross over with each other uh, and we'll talk about why that is but did you find similar or even different characteristics that were pointed out about his kingdom like this one it says there will be an abundance of peace um, compassion will be shown to the poor and the needy uh, the oppressors will be broken it will be a time of righteous judgment prayer will be made for him continually so it'll be a worshipful time there will be an abundance of grain and those in the city walls will flourish. The whole earth will be filled with his glory. Good. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, this- will endure forever, but uh, Solomon's was soon ended and extinct. Yeah, and-, and you know, when you step back and think about this psalm, and, and certainly in that day when it was, if it was put forth early in his kingdom or even at the end of his kingdom, whenever it might have been put forth, um, there had to have been, for those that believe this was talking about Solomon, there had to be a great deal of disappointment when Solomon died or, or if it was early on when Solomon went off the rails as far as his walk with the Lord. Uh, and not only that, I mean, if you took this from a strictly uh, human perspective and took the, the messianic implications out and took out um, God out of this equation, this is, a, this is kind of a standard politician's wish list here. I mean, this is like one of those uh, uh, State of the Union addresses. You go, oh, we're going to have uh, you know, abundant grain, and we're going to have peace and prosperity, and we're going to, the poor are going to be, going to find justice, and so forth, and so uh, if, if people were only seeing it in Solomon's day, or after, it, through human eyes, then it would be, it would, it would be a big disappointment, ultimately, because Solomon is going to reign for 40 years, and then he's going to be dead, and that's going to be the end of Solomon's reign, and for those people that only saw it through human eyes, the end of these promises. But these are promises that are going to find fulfillment in Christ, and they're big promises. They can only find fulfillment in the Messiah. I think Solomon was able to make these promises because uh, he had uh, a vision of being in, in the lineage of Christ. Uh, I think 
he uh, had revelation in his heart about the the real distant future, you know, the millennial reign. So I think he was able to make these proclamations and, and these prayer, this prayer with a, a great deal of uh, not only hope, but knowledge about what was going to happen in the future. Right. I think if we start with verse one, where he says, give, uh, give the king your judgment, so God, and your righteousness to the king's son, uh, you know, there is a real neat double meaning there, because he's asking for uh, judgment, which he is going to literally ask God for, he does here, but we have it recorded there in, in second Kings, our first Kings where he asked God to give him judgment to be able to judge this great people. And uh, so he asked on his behalf, and he is the king's son, King David's son. Uh, so he invokes David's name here. But then you can also take and apply this to Christ uh, to give judgment to him, who is also the king's son. He is God's son. Uh, and that's going to be fulfilled too. So there is a dual, uh, there's a, a dual understanding in this psalm that it is talking about Solomon, but there are many things that can only be true of, of Christ and only be true of Christ's kingdom. Solomon did accomplish a lot of these things to an, a certain extent. Uh, the, the nation of Israel saw the greatest expansion of its borders under King Solomon. Uh, it, it saw a time of really the greatest time of peace and prosperity the kingdom ever had. Uh, Solomon was was not a a, warf, a warfaring king like David was. Uh, Solomon had largely a peaceful rule, uh, and it had a lot to do with his wisdom, which when you take that out and extrapolate it out, it wasn't just the wisdom to write proverbs and to, to uh, pen parts of God's word. It was wisdom in diplomacy and wisdom in dealing with other nations and negotiations to where war wasn't necessary. And so uh, a lot of these Solomon was able to fulfill to a limited capacity, but Christ will fulfill them to the full. Anyone else in 72? Verse 20 is there. The well, it has, it's a little confusing uh, because we're going to see next week, we're going to look at another Psalm of David, uh, but it's on past this point. Uh, and so it's a little bit confusing. It has to do with the division of uh, the books of the Psalms. Uh, and that's more of a, uh, what do they call it, like ecclesiastical or a, a worship um division that the jews divided the book into parts uh based on what the greater focus was on each part so most study bibles if you have a study bible the next chapter above psalm 73 will, will probably say something like book three psalm 73 to 89 and then you have the final uh book the psalms of ascents uh after that um, so it, it has to do with that. It's, it's, it's more of a, like I said, a worship notation or a, a division notation uh, more than anything. The majority of the Psalms prior to this are from David or concerning David. The majority of the Psalms after this are, are going to be, um, we're going to see next week, the sons of Korah and, and other authors, but you still have some Psalms of David too. But I had that question too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, but it, it does throw a little bit of confusion, especially because, and, and I think there's a little bit of controversy about this psalm, whether Solomon wrote it or whether Solomon's the subject and David wrote it or said it as a prayer. Uh, and it just depends on, on who you read. And uh, it's certainly Solomon is the subject um, and most regard Solomon as the author, but I think that notation throws us off a little bit. Yeah, the last thing we read in Chronicles in our reading for um, prepping for this was that David had died. And then we came to that and it says the prayers of David, the son of Jesse are ended. And I thought, wow, <laughs> <laughs> that, 
how they connected, but. So I don't have an absolutely firm answer for you. That's that's the best we can do with it. That's what the information we have to work with. I kind of took it as it was the end of this, uh, just the end of this psalm and what he was praying to the Lord. Yeah, but again, it, the, the notation at the beginning makes it refers to this being a song or a, a, a psalm of Solomon, but that makes it sound like it's a psalm of David and. And it may be that they it may be that they both prayed it together, and I, I think that's a perfectly legitimate way to look at it as well. Because I think you have this wonderful scene, um, both in first or at the end of Second Samuel, and uh, then here in First Chronicles, where father and son are working together, uh, yeah. and it, and they're not just the two of them; they're working in conjunction with the Spirit of God to uh, facilitate this next step in the Davidic covenant. And so I think it's very likely that uh, this was something maybe that David actually prayed and Solomon wrote down. Well, it could be too there at the end when David is passing the kingdom to right. Solomon, they could have prayed this together right. or David could have prayed this for Solomon or knowing that the temple's going to be built and knowing that his time is over, but God's kingdom will live forever. So you could definitely see some kind of correlation there. Anyone else? Questions or comments? All right, well, let's go to 145 and you'll still have an opportunity at the end if you have any applications or further comments or questions on any of the, the scripture passages we look at tonight. But let's go on to 145. And what classification of Psalm did you find this to be? Praise. Praise, okay. Anyone else? It's much really the same. Uh, yeah. We shouldn't surprise us because it's... Uh, uh, connected to the same uh, historical section. It is a, has some messianic uh, elements and it is an enthronement psalm as well. It speaks much about the king and the kingdom again. Uh, this one is, is written by David, but again, this is after that, um, uh, that notation that the, psalm, the prayers of David have ended. And so that uh, we're not gonna find that there are no psalms of David after 72. Uh, and this is one of them that is a, a Davidic psalm. And there's no uh, notations or special instructions here. So who is the subject of this psalm? And these are pretty much the same questions because it's a very similar psalm. Who's, who is the subject of this psalm? And how do we know who this psalm refers to? It says it's the praise of David, um, praising him for his majesty, love, and wisdom. Good. Was that right? Yes, yep. absolutely. Oh, yeah, okay. it, it, it specifically mentions God the King. So mm -hmm. uh, it's going to talk about a specific kingdom again, just like 72 did. So uh, is it talking about God? Is it talking about Christ? Who do you think it's talking about? I think, it, I think it's talking about God. About who? About God? Okay, good. Yeah, you can view it as both because, and we've got a couple reasons why. Um, number one, God and Christ are, are one. Uh, even though they, they are uh, separate personalities, they are one. Uh, but the, the greater thing is something we looked at a few weeks ago in Psalm 2, and that is that this kingdom that, that is going to be in view here uh, is going to be given over by God to Jesus Christ. And we saw that in Psalm 2. We see it in Philippians chapter 2 and certainly see it elsewhere in Scripture that all things are going to be given over to the uh, authority and rule of uh, the Son of God. So, it's appropriate to look at this psalm speaking both about God as well as the King of Kings, who's going to uh, who's going to reign in the kingdom that is talked about here in this psalm. Anyone else? 
on that question? <clears throat> also, uh, God is used here in all capital letters, which yeah. is equivalent to Yahweh and Lord, which is the proper name of God of Israel. So, so I think this is basically speaking of the Father, although there are implications to, across the Christ. Good. Exactly. Yeah, you have Lord in all caps, which we've talked about before, he is speaking of Yahweh uh, or Jehovah. And so it is uh, who David would properly view uh, as the king. Uh, but again, as, De as uh, Ed said, there are also some implications and some references that we can apply this praise to, to Christ as well. Uh, in Mark um, 12, 35 to 37, Jesus quotes David, who says, uh, you know, David said, the Lord said to my Lord, uh, and he used that as a reference to the fact that David was talking about someone greater than himself, who was also going to be a descendant of his. He was talking about Jesus Christ. He was talking about the Messiah. So uh, this, this kingdom, again, is God's kingdom that he's going to hand over to, uh, to the Messiah. Yeah. Very good. What are some of the characteristics of this king? And they're going to be a lot of the same as we saw, but I think uh, uh, you might find a few different ones as well. What did you find? His greatness is unsearchable, and it speaks of his mighty acts. Good. Yeah, you know, this is something that's that we're still supposed to do, and uh, and that and we do. I, I think that's part of uh, the wonder of preaching is to to go back and, and review God's mighty acts in the past. From David's point of view, he's looking back from his time back to the point of creation and uh, praising God for His mighty acts, His deeds. Uh, we talked. Uh, we've been talking in the Gospel of John that you know, Jesus has said both in ten, and then He even said to the disciples in the upper room. Uh, if you don't believe me for just the sake of belief, then believe the works I do. Uh, and those works come from the Father. And this, this is the same thing. It's these marvelous works that God has done that demonstrate his faithfulness, the works that Christ has done that demonstrated who he was and his faithfulness. And those works come from the Father. And then the works that God and Jesus Christ are going to do. Uh, particularly as we look at the last days and uh, the tribulation time and the wrath of God are part of his works that are going to be poured out. And then the works that Messiah is going to do in the kingdom, which we have a, a whole, you know, a reference of them, in, especially in the book of Ezekiel. And so uh, to, to praise God for what he has done is perfectly appropriate. Anyone else? I, I, I thought it was also so... I mean, it's overwhelming when you read this because it it not only points to his greatness and his splendor and his majesty and his works, but his attitude towards us as his people and even people that are not believers. And, um, you know, gracious, full of compassion, slow to anger, great in mercy, good to all. Only God is good to all. <laughs> And his tender mercies are over all his works. I mean, it just goes on and on and, and brings out God's glorious majesty and his, uh, his dominion endures throughout all generations and how he feels about us. The Lord upholds all who fall, raises up all who are bowed down. It just is such a picture of his love and and compassion towards us. Yeah, I, I think that that's a really good observation. Um, and I, I loved what uh, what Debbie said that only God can really genuinely be good to all and and love all in the way that they're supposed to be loved. And I think it's another. Um, good example of God's attitude towards the whole world that we oftentimes forget about in the Old Testament. We get this idea God only deals with the Jews in the Old Testament, that he always despises the Gentiles, and we forget little jewels like this, and we forget the book of Jonah because we think about Jonah, but we forget that really the focus of the book of Jonah is Nineveh. 
and God's graciousness to a pagan nation. We forget about in Daniel where God is, is beaming the light uh, of, of, of hope and the light of the, the gospel, the Old Testament style gospel through Daniel to the Babylonians and to the Persians. And so that, that's a great observation. Anyone else? I also saw that he was eternal and unsearchable and praiseworthy. I have Debbie's whole list. Um, <laughs> he's satisfying and generous. He's near to all those who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. And he's holy. Very good. Very good. Anyone else? I think David has a great personal perspective of God because of his relationship with God through, uh, through his lifetime. You know, you don't find words like this anywhere else in the Bible, except uh, here in Psalms and how David, how David spoke those words and how prophetic, how, how true they are. Uh, it's real, I, I agree with Debbie, it's really amazing how rich this Psalm is in, in uh praising God and giving, giving God glory. Yeah, and I would agree with Marty. Uh, you have other places in scripture where you have some of these descriptive terms and praises to God, but it's the perspective here that is so different and, and so personal. And that's one of the reasons I, I just think we should revisit, we should be in the Psalms continually like we have been being in the in the Psalms of Proverbs or in the Book of Proverbs, uh, because it, it's all scriptures given by inspiration of God. But there's this maybe more than anywhere in Scripture this wonderful intertwining of yes, it's the Word of God absolutely and is authoritative. But you have the heart of David uh, as well that is is fully revealed to us, and how only God can do that to take the the human and the, the spiritual and put them together and we can have, you know, absolute confidence that this is God's word, but it's David's heart. And, and it can be our heart too. We, we can have the same attitude if we desire to. Yeah. And I believe that David's saying this every day. I mean, he says in verse two, every day, yeah. I will bless you. You know, when, when a heart is poured out like it is here in 145 and you hear the things that David said, this didn't just come off the top of his head. This is a heart that's close to God, that depends on him, and that sings his praises back to him. And if we could only grasp this and sing this every day in our own hearts, the truths that are true how God relates to us and how great he is. And, and I liked that there weren't all great uh, majestic words, but words like he's kind yeah. and he's near. Those are very yeah. relatable um, to us. Yeah, I, and that's a, that's a good point from Carol too, that these are, they're simple words. David is not a theologian. And we don't have to speak theological terms to give praise to God. These are there's yeah. a lot of very sim simple terms here, just just kindness. And uh, lo and behold, that's one of the, the fruit of the spirit. So it, it shouldn't be remarkable to us that we can take such a simple word and apply it to God. He's just simply kind. Uh, there, there's an important contrast in, in verse 20, and that's the Lord preserves all those who love him but all the wicked he will destroy. And so while we've got a lot of what we might say positivity uh, and, and positive elements, there's still, God is just. And, and there's, it, it, this is not a universal, universalistic psalm uh, where God has set aside, you know, what he said before and everybody's welcome into the kingdom. Uh, there's still that standard, that righteousness that God demands that's certainly fulfilled in Christ uh, and, and fulfilled by the faith relationship in the Old Testament uh, that, uh, that's the same as we have today. Um, uh, and there's still a, a judgment for failing to have faith in God and to come to him on his terms. 
And so that's an important aspect of the kingdom as well. There's still going to be justice in the kingdom. And let's talk uh, just a little bit about the kingdom. What, did you find any uh, characteristics of the kingdom as opposed to the, the king himself, specifically about the kingdom in 145? Well, it talks about the kingdom being glorious. Yes. Yeah. Majestic and everlasting. Good. And, and really, those are the three that I found, too. And you may have found some others, but it's specifically where the kingdom itself is mentioned. We have three really key phrases, glorious, majestic, and everlasting. And what what it, you look at these two Psalms and, you, and one of the reasons I wanted to, to separate what does it say about the kingdom and what does it say about the king is what's the relationship between uh, what the Psalms both Psalms say about the king and what both Psalms say about the relate uh, about the kingdom? What kind of relationship do you see there? I like verse 17 where it says he's righteous in all his ways and holy in all his works. Yeah. And, oh, and it I, speaks I, of eternity also. Yes. Good. Anyone else? Well, they're inseparable. You can't separate the king from the kingdom. No. Because the king yeah. is glorious, the king is majestic, and the king is everlasting. Amen. The is the same. Exactly. And, and you know, that's something that we rarely, if ever, really see in, in human <clears throat> governments and kingdoms where we have a uh, a king that puts forth here's what i'm going to do and here's and here's what really happened christ's kingdom and god's kingdom christ's kingdom is going to be perfectly reflective of the character and the nature of the one who is ruling the kingdom and we have that today unfortunately again they might say we're going to rule this way but the, the nature of their kingdom is, is often very different. Um, it is reflective of their character and nature, but it's not reflective of their promises. The great thing about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Christ, which are one and the same, is that they've said, here's going to be the character of the kingdom. Here is the character of the king. And that is absolutely going to be what the character of the kingdom is going to be. And uh, I think that's wonderful because it, it, we're so used to being disappointed in our uh, in our governor in our governance and in those who govern us, and we we will we will not be disappointed. We will be pleasantly delighted, and uh, and fortunately, I think we'll be surprised. Because we shouldn't be because it's God making the promise, but uh, we're going to be we're going to be pleasantly surprised and pleasantly delighted that Christ will keep every promise. And uh, his kingdom will perfectly reflect his righteous nature. For all of this, um, this grandness, um, what strikes me is verse 18, the Lord is near to all who call upon him. Yes. He hasn't forgotten us little people. <laughs> I mean, you know, the kingdom is grand and all that, but he is there for us also. He'll preserve all who love him. Yeah, and, and that, that called to mind when I was reading that this week. Um, I think it's first, I think it's uh, Paul to the Corinthians that the word is near uh, even to your heart and to your tongue. Uh, and he, he's right there. It's the, the, you know, whether it's salvation for those who don't know Christ, it's that close. They, they just have to call on the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Or for those believers that are struggling, or, or as David, we see so oftentimes in the Psalm. Yeah is uh, feeling uh, trodden down. He's right there. He's near to the brokenhearted. Uh, he's, he's ready to, to serve and he's ready to comfort. He's ready to strengthen. That's, that's a great observation, Ginger. Carol, I don't know why Carol won't say this, but <laughs> I had this in my notes as well, but she pointed out that uh, he's talking about both the, I, I think it's actually threefold. Uh, it's the kingdom that is in force when David is king, it's God's kingdom, uh, or it's the, it's the millennial kingdom, 
uh, that will be enforced during the thousand year reign of Christ. And then it's also the eternal kingdom. And there are three kingdoms that are, are, are separate, but, but they're interrelated. And they all bear the same characteristics and they bear, uh, they bear the same ruler. Uh, and so what's great is the future kingdoms that are yet to come, we can, we can judge based on the nature of how God has ruled the, his present kingdom and his kingdom in the past. And they're just remarkably consistent and, uh, because they're based on the very character of God. Anyone else? I really liked 14, 15, and 16. And, and I just put for what, as a characteristic of the kingdom, that um, it's upheld by the Lord and the people are satisfied by a generous kingdom. But I love those verses because it's such a cool picture of, you know, God just holding his hand out and, and giving the people what they need. And I just thought it was cool. Yeah, that, that uh, 15 is a, is a neat passage uh, because it's, I, I think about uh, the 23rd Psalm and the eyes of uh, all look expectantly to you and you give them their food and their season. And again, I think about the uh, 23rd Psalm has really stuck with me this, uh, these last several months as we've been going through the Psalms and through John uh, as Jesus did the Good Shepherd Discourse that the, uh, the sheep got so dependent upon the shepherd that they would look for him. I mean, they were listening for his voice and they were looking expectantly toward him, uh, especially when they had a need. Uh, and when they needed uh, green gr grass to graze and, and still waters, uh, they looked to the shepherd to guide them. And this is a picture of us or what we should be, that we should be looking expectantly to the shepherd. Uh, again, in John 14, we've just seen whatever you ask in, in my name, I will give to you. And, and again, the caveat certainly is in his will, within his will, but uh, we can look expectantly to him that he's going to meet our needs. Yeah, it's a, it's a great picture of the faithful, those that are faithful to him. We don't look anywhere else for our needs, but those that love him and are faithful to him, <laughs> look to him for everything. And so this is a really good picture of that. I like the promises in, in verse 20 and the, uh, the eternality, if that's a, a word, I just probably made that up. Uh, but in, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> in verse 20 says, the Lord keeps all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. Um, you know, when... Christ at the end of the millennial reign throws uh, Satan into the pit and all sin is gone forever and ever. That's going to be an amazing thing. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. I'm looking forward to watching Christ uh, throw Satan into the pit, and lock him away forever. Uh, but uh, verse 21 says, my mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and all flesh will bless his holy name forever and ever. Yeah. Praise will never cease. That's right. Yeah, again, that points you to passages like Philippians 2.10, where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to, glory, to the glory of God the Father. Uh, and all flesh will bless his holy name. And as Marty pointed out, forever and ever, there's always going to be praise on our lips uh, for eternity. It doesn't mean that that's all we're going to do is sit around and, and you know, bless the name of the Lord. It means that, that it's always going to be on our lips. That there's always going to be an attitude of, of praise towards uh, the king uh, of, this, uh, of this eternal and glorious, majestic, and everlasting kingdom. Yes, I mean, God will be continually worshipped. We see the four, right. uh, the four creatures in Revelation, and that's what they do. They go around the throne room continually, day and night, singing holy, holy, holy. So it kind of reminds me of that, too, that we'll be doing the same thing, praising him continually. Let's hit this last question, and then we'll take any more, uh, anything that stood out to you or uh, any uh, practical applications. But... Just real quick, how are these two psalms related to the historical passages? 
we've really kind of talked about it along the way, but did you find anything specifically where you saw a real solid relationship between the two that you want to add? I was touched with the fact in Psalm 72, died. David knew he was going, he was before his death. And I looked at it as a, a father's dying blessing uh, to his son, yes. Solomon. Yeah. yeah, I agree. Uh, that's the really, um, I think, poignant connection between the two is. Uh, and again, it has to do with that, that dying blessing, but also the realization of the, and the, and the just absolute faith that God is going to fulfill this covenant that he's made with David and with his line. And so there's just a real strong uh, covenant affirmation in, uh, in these two Psalms that's really connected to the end of David's life. Very good. All right, anyone else on that question or anything else? Any uh, practical applications you found or just something that really stood out to you that you haven't mentioned yet or uh, just a favorite verse or two that you saw in these, these Psalms or in the, the, the historical passages as well? No, in Sunday school, um, we've talked a couple of times about our salvation and how amazing it is and uh a word always keeps coming to my mind and i think i mentioned the last three weeks i think probably in a row um we like to use the words i deserve something i and i look and i read like psalm 145 and i see how gracious god is um and how he is merciful and kind and loving and I can see how I am with my own child sometimes and I don't feel gracious and loving and merciful. And uh, I see how much more he does for me and how even though the world says we deserve so much, I don't see we deserve, we don't deserve this God. And uh, yeah. we don't That's deserve right. to have this opportunity to to worship him and to be near to him and let him fulfill our desires. I mean, we don't, we don't deserve that. And it makes it even more amazing uh, when you see how awesome he is, when you realize it's truly because of him and nothing to do with me. Uh, as if it right. was up to me, there's nothing I could have. Amen. I, yeah, I would, Okay, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. I was really struck reading in Chronicles, um, and I think it just really hit me. Um, you know, I, I appreciate church. I appreciate our church a lot. I'm sorry. Um, but when you have it taken away from you and shut down, you appreciate a lot more. And I think reading David's words, um, you know, 28-2, he calls, you know, he wanted to to build a house of rest, a footstool for God. And um, in 29, he said he set his affection on the house of God and um, he prepared with all of his might in preparation for the temple and setting um, him up in 29, two. And then in 29, 17, he's willingly offered. And those things just hit me, especially the house of rest. Cause I mean, you, it is, I mean, it's such, a place of peace and comfort and you know when you don't have it you appreciate it all the more i'm sorry <laughs> i'm sorry i understand i yeah. understand amen so pastor when we fall asleep during the preaching it's because <laughs> we're in the house of rest <laughs> <laughs> well said anthony well said <laughs> no uh mike parman's not here tonight but you know God bless Mike Parman because, you know, he goes to these auctions and he brought a whole box of Keurig cups that are in the kitchen. So, Anthony, I want you to feel free to make you a, <laughs> because these are, these are double caffeinated Keurig cups. 
Oh, wow. <laughs> I said, wow, well, Mike, we're going to have people wired in the church. I mean, we might have some speaking in tongues or something. <laughs> I don't know about that. It was much better than the, the time somebody brought in the whole box of sleepy time tea. <laughs> 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 right very good anyone else i i guess i again that the overwhelming thing of all uh, reading all this too is just it speaks and i think others have said this god's majesty and grace but yet his intimate and personal care for each one of us Amen. yeah and what what a unique characteristic of any kingdom i mean there's not any kingdom that's been able to live up to that even yeah. as we have these kinds of promises in our own day where all the you know there's going to be a safety net or there's going to be this that's going to take care of you you're going to get a check or whatever here is uh here is someone who's going to take care of each individual need personally and it's 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 guaranteed because it's it's based on the good name of God and on the good name of Jesus Christ. And he's going to not just meet the wants, he's going to meet the needs. He's going to meet the deepest needs that we have. And I think just the coolest thing about this is this is not, uh, you know, just as we've talked about, it's not just the kingdom of heaven. Now we're going to live in this kingdom. As Marty pointed out a while ago, this, this is where we're going. When Christ says, I go to prepare a place for you. This is part of that place. We're gonna we're gonna be residents, and uh, we're gonna be members of this kingdom. And uh, wow! Not only that, we're gonna be related to the king. That's right. Wow! It's an amazing thing that, and that ought to that ought to be enough to carry us through any difficult days and any hard times that we go through, because we have this place that. Uh, that's not just, it's not pie in the sky. This is reality. This is, this is not just a spiritual uh, metaphor. This is a reality mm -hmm. that uh, we can lay hold of and say, this is where you want to see where I'm going. Look at this. This is where I'm going. Uh, I'm going to be a part of this kingdom right here. That's amazing. Hey, Jim, in, in 72, six, um, that verse, may he be like rain that falls on the mown grass like showers that water the earth. What, I, I take great pleasure when I get to go out and work in the yard. And if you ever get out and cut grass and then it rains right afterwards, the way and when it stops and when the sun shines, there's something about the smell of the grass and the way that the, the grass shines when the sun's coming down. There was just something beautiful about that picture. The grass is being watered. There's, there's new life. And, and the idea that, that Christ is going to be that for us you know, we have this to look forward to. I just thought that was a beautiful picture. Yeah, I think that's a good, that's a good example of how you can come to, to scripture and God can really highlight something. Uh, God's spirit can really highlight something that we can have a real direct connection to. So I appreciate yeah. that, Jay. That's great. Anyone else? Last chance, anyone else? All right, study 17 is, is posted. I'll have some printed copies out tomorrow night if you wanna pick up a printed copy to not tomorrow or Sunday, uh, but otherwise it's already, I haven't mailed it out. I'll, I'll attach it to an email, but it is available at the link with all the other Psalm studies. Uh, and so we'll be back here, I think, be back here on zoom again next week uh, until we can put behind us the at least put behind us the threat of uh, weather and stuff we thought we'd just stay on zoom and then maybe get back together uh once the all the opportunities for weather unless it snows on easter again <laughs> pray not but it sounds like pretty cold this week so everybody stay safe and stay warm and uh, keep your eye on the email for tomorrow night we're we're Still planning on doing the, the kids for truth thing, but uh, I know they were talking about snow this morning, and so it'll just depend on what things look like. But uh, 
All right. Anybody else? Last chance. Any comments? All right. Let's pray. Go ahead. Thank you. Oh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for such an encouraging time in your word. Father, certainly the things that we've read and the things we see in these Psalms and the relationship between David and Solomon and you right in the middle of that relationship is such an encouragement to us, but also the time that we can share together and then we can hear how you've used your word in each one's uh, life and in their study this week. Father, help us to keep our eyes and our hearts and our hopes fixed on these things, knowing that you have said that this will be the nature of your kingdom and it will come to pass. And what a great encouragement and comfort that is. Father, again, we pray for those that we mentioned earlier and many other needs that might be on hearts tonight, Lord, that uh, your will would be done in each situation to your glory and honor. And Father, we uh, pray that you watch over each one as they go about the, uh, uh, the business of the days uh, this week. Uh, some have to go to work and school and other, other things. Lord, just keep them safe while they're out in the weather. And we just pray that uh, you would bring us together uh, soon. Uh, that we might uh, rejoice together in your presence and your spirit. In Christ's name, amen. 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 God bless Thank you me. all. Bye, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Bye, Good night. everybody. Bye. Bye. Good night. Do you have to work on? Good night, my someone. Good